Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary with the Get Some Podcast. And my guest this week is... <laughs> this motherfucking Gary. <laughs> Hey, what's up? This is Gary Owen looking beat up with the Get Some podcast. Uh, yeah, it looks like I got some this week. Hey, I'll get into why I'm all stitched up in a minute. But uh, like always, let me start off with my schedule. For the next two weeks, starting tonight, I'm at the Houston Improv. Tonight through Sunday, and then next week, 11th to the 14th, my new adopted hometown. Cincinnati's always going to be home, baby, but Houston is now my second home. Uh, so I'll be here for the next two weeks at the Improv. We already, I think, five. I've got 12 shows for sale. As of right now, five have sold out. Uh, so we're going to probably end up adding shows. But uh, you might want to get your tickets right now. So, And then April 19th to the 21st, I'm in Greenville, South Carolina at the Comedy Zone. April 26th to the 28th, I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the improv and then let's just go into may shall we since we're here uh may 3rd through the 5th i'm in colleen texan colleen texan colleen texas at the twice as funny comedy lounge may 10th through the 12th i'm in pleasanton california tommy t's bay area a uh, may 17th through the 8 19th i'm in jacksonville florida at the comedy zone and then may 23rd through the 26th i'm in addison uh, Texas was basically Dallas at the uh, improv over there. So last week I was in Wichita, Kansas, and Evansville, Indiana. Man, great shows right there. Great shows. Uh, Evansville was super packed. And then uh, Wichita was crowded. We were up against Blake Shelton in Wichita because I pulled up and I go, I mean, Wichita is kind of small and it looked exactly like I thought Wichita would look very flat. There's a downtown, but then there's a lot of farming equipment uh uh places like you see the line of tractors a line of like i don't know just stuff to farm with all over on the side of the highway like these big huge industrial places you buy farming equipment so uh blake shelton was there so i was like dang the the traffic's crazy coming to see me ah <laughs> I mean, we had a great show, but it wasn't like Blake Shelton, who had probably 50,000 people or something like that. We just had like, eh, cool 1,500. I'll take it. <laughs> so, anyways, I, uh, I posted I posted like a picture on, on Instagram of my face. I had a bandage on the other day, of, and people thought it was an April Fool's joke that I got 10 stitches. No, this is real. Uh, didn't get beat up. Nothing happened like that. I had skin cancer. It's like a, what is it? A mel what do they call it? A melanoma or something like that. Like I, it's weird. Last, like two years ago, I found something on my forehead. I had a mark and I went and got it checked out. And if you look at my comedy special, Black Famous, you can see the scar running down my head and it healed up nicely. And it was like a little line here that I had for like over a year. And I just went and got it checked out and sure enough. And then I saw something similar on the side of my eyebrow and I go, ah, not again. And then I went in and they go, yeah, I kind of figured. So it's weird, like something so small, the size of like a piece of rice, like one rice, that that's what it takes to get it out. Because what they do is you get it checked out. They run, they, they run a culture on it, right? And then they call you and they go, yeah, it's, it's you know, not life-threatening or anything like that. I don't want to give people to think like that. But cancer, that word scares people. So... They said, you know, we're, yeah, it's uh whatever, melanoma, or I can't pronounce the stuff. Anyways, yeah, you got you got skin cancer. It's, that's what it is. So what they do, you go in, and they numb you up, and you can hear the doctor doing shit to your skull, and you're like, this is supposed to hurt, and it doesn't. And then you have to sit there for like an hour, and they run tests on it. And then they come back, and both times when it was on my forehead and my eyebrow, when they came back, my forehead they said it was deeper than they thought, so they had to really get in there. So I had a scar. It was it was kind of dope actually, the way it looked for a little while. Look like I was a badass, and one of them 
James Bond movies like The Bad Guy. And then this one wasn't deep, but it was wider. They said, so that's a good thing. They said, so that's why I got such a big scar. So I'll be I'll be looking rough this week uh, at the Improv in Houston. So I don't know. I was going to make up a story, but uh, maybe not. So anyways, uh, there's a couple of things I want to get into. Uh, I asked Twitter for questions this week because I feel like a better way for me to connect to people uh, is to figure out what they want to hear about. Uh, but I'll get into those questions in a minute. I guess the big topic this week was uh, – there's two things. One was the basketball tournament. Now, the men's is one thing, but the female basketball tournament is so polarizing with Caitlin Clark – and Iowa beating LSU a couple of days ago. And it's, it's you know, Jamel Hill, Jamel Hill, who I always thought we was cool. And if you don't know who she is, look, look her up. She used to be on ESPN. She's a She was actually one of the few black female on her personalities for a long time on ESPN. And I always thought me and her had a good relationship. Like she had a couple different shows that I went on. <clears throat> on uh, ESPN, and I really like her, and I, and I still do like her. But I, she, and this is how it got back to me, and I could be wrong. Like back in 2019, I was in a, I was at the Marriott by the San Francisco airport, and I was watching the Portland Trailblazers against the Oklahoma City Thunder, and it was the game where Dame Lillard hit that shot in Game Seven that took out Portland, and. Sorry, I'm just good. And uh, I wrote a tweet, and it really happened in real time. It wasn't like I made this up. When I was sitting there watching the game, I was with a couple of buddies of mine. They were black dudes, and then there was a for some reason there was like a like a table full of probably like six black dudes walk watching the game, and they were rooting for Portland. And when when Dame Lillard hit that shot to beat Oklahoma City, one of the brothers. At the other table, stood up and he's like that, and we're hit that shit. <laughs> and I and I I looked at the guys I was sitting at the table at, and I go, man, I I kind of, uh. oh, oh no, he said that, and we're hit that shit. That's what he said. And then right when he said that, the TVs went to uh, Portland's head coach, and he just had a stunned look on his face. And I go, I looked at the guys I was at the table with. I said, yeah, Portland's coach wants to say the same thing, but he's not allowed. <laughs> and so. My table started cracking up. So I went to Twitter and I literally tweeted that exact thing. I said, Portland's coach wants to say that. And I typed out N word. Didn't type out spell, spell. I didn't spell out the N word. I literally typed out N space W O R D. I said, but he's not allowed. And everyone started cracking up. A couple people said that you, you can't be saying stuff like that, but that's, that's social media, right? The guys that I was sitting with was cracking up. And even I started talking to the table that was rooting for Portland because, you know, guy things, you're watching sports, you just start hugging each other if your team wins and stuff. Nobody was hugging. We were laughing and talking about the game. And the brothers knew me, so I think I built up enough rapport with the black community that I was a white, that, white guy that could say something like that. So we're all cracking up, right? I was supposed to go on Jamil Hill's podcast like a month later, and I got the call. She canceled me. Because of that tweet. So I was a little taken back, honestly, because I thought me and Jamil was cool. And I thought something like that, if she didn't agree with my tweet, would be something that we could discuss on her show. And I didn't know she was taking a stance like that. And since then, she's really gone left as far as like now she's not with ESPN. She can really express who she really is. And she's very much... She's not anti-white. I hate when people say she's racist. She's not. But she's very pro-black. And I guess I was taken back by her because she knows I'm a comedian. So she knows I'm everything I say is like, I'm kidding. It, it, it's not serious. And there's no, like I always say, there's no malicious intent behind it. No ill will behind it. It was a joke. Whether you think it's funny or not, it was a joke. And comedians, we say jokes. And on social media and in real life, obviously. So... This week, she really started going in on a uh, – and, and I, I hope Jamil sees this and maybe we can talk again. Not that I need to, but I think it would be a – I think it would be an interesting discussion if I went on one of her platforms or she came on mine and we could discuss it because she's not stupid. She's very smart. 
uh, and whether you agree with her or disagree with her, uh, she's not one to just say something without having her ducks aligned of why she's saying things. And like I said, I don't have to agree with everything she says. It doesn't mean I don't like her as a person. I disagree what she said about Caitlin Clark this week. She was saying like she's getting a lot of this extra media coverage because she's white and she wishes they would do that for more uh, black players that are moving the game forward. And so in one aspect, she's right. Uh, obviously, when you have a white person that is in a predominantly black sport that uh, or and it's listen, it's not just a white person a black sport. It's no different than Tiger Woods was a black person in a predominantly white dominated sport, which is golf. When and I call it anomalies like that happen, I go, it's obvious they're going to get more press uh, for something like this. It's always usually the first. Once it happens, it's not a big of a it's not that big of a deal. But I think for female basketball, someone like Caitlin Clark. It's not just the, she's white. It's white. She's playing for Iowa. <laughs> I don't think it would be as – it would still be a big deal but not as big of a deal if she was playing for Alabama or Connecticut or t- – not Alabama. I would say Connecticut, Tennessee, even South Carolina, one of these – with Baylor, one of these now that have been these powerhouse programs lately. It's just Iowa was cool. They were Big Ten, but nobody's really paying attention to Iowa until Caitlin Clark got there. And it's not the fact that she's just a white girl averaging 30-some points a game. It's how she's doing it. She's doing these bounce passes that has just got the defenses looking stupid. She's bringing the ball off the court. She's hitting threes like four feet behind the three-point line. It's ridiculous. She's must-see TV. And just her being white adds on to it. But that's not the only reason because if you look at it like that, these other white players that are on these other teams, the white girl in Connecticut, the Van Lith girl on LSU, the the big girl on Stanford, and I'm not saying their names because I don't know them because they're not getting pressed like that. I don't. I know Connecticut's got a badass white girl that's balling right now. Uh, I know – the LSU white girl, Van Lith, I know she came from Louisville. She was balling. But they were getting pressed because they weren't doing what Caitlin Clark does. And you could say the second most popular girl is Angel Reese. And de- depending on what region you're in, who's going to be more popular. So I don't think that's the only reason. Obviously, that has something to do with it. But to say... Uh, <laughs> people are wrong. I'm like, all right. I think she was. Uh, I, I just say I think Jamel was reaching on that article, but that goes with her brand right now. She she really makes a lot of things about race. I don't think she's a racist. I just think she, it's almost like she's looking for reasons for people or the media to be against black people or not promoting black athletes as much as they should and like i said anytime there's a, a an anomaly it's because you got right now like christian mccaffrey is the arguably the best running back in the nfl white dude that's not normal they hell they got the the db out of iowa hold on let me let me look his name up he's gonna be the first cornerback uh, iowa cornerback look if i put iowa cornerback White guy. Watch him pop up. Uh, Cooper. Look, first thing out the box, his name pops up. Cooper DeJean. He's going to be a first-round pick, most likely. He's a white dude from Iowa. What's going on with Iowa? If you Listen, I'll just say, if you was going to name a state where you think a white running back, a white cornerback – a white girl that would be the number one pick in the WNBA that isn't like a monster, like super tall, not like a Brittany Griner or something, you would say Iowa. That would probably be the first day you say Iowa, Montana, a state like that. Like Iowa's, I would say Iowa's got pound for pound, 
probably the best white athletes that played traditionally black dominated positions come out of Iowa. Remember Tim Dwight, the kickoff and punt returner from Iowa that played for the Atlanta Falcons? I, I mean, that guy was, he was a track star. So, uh, yeah, I just think that's obviously that has something to do with it, but it's, it's no different than, uh, you know, Tommy Morrison. He got a lot of press because he was a white guy that was a heavyweight boxer that was American too. And that type of sport. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, you got Tiger Woods. I think Serena and Venus. They got a lot of press, and they they wouldn't have got the press they got if they weren't black in a white dominated sport. A lot of a lot of their a lot of their uh, what do you call it? Um, heat and people were curious is because they never seen black girls play. Now there's four or five black girls on the tennis circuit that are crushing it. Uh, so I think when you're the first for something like this, I think it's, I think this is the first time since the WNBA has come around that we've seen a, a white female basketball player dominate in the fashion she's dominating. And she's not a big. She's a guard. Like, she's bringing the ball up. She's, I mean, she's like a, almost dang a walking. She could be a walking triple-double if she wanted to. Uh, so I think that's what – I think Jamil was reaching on that. I just think when you're the first – like this, this, this guy. Watch, watch how much heat we we hear about Cooper DeJean this this um, this uh, draft. If he's he's gonna be the first white cornerback in like thirty years, uh, it's just not a position white guys play. We get moved to safety or other positions. Uh, people forget Brian Urlacher was a safety when he went to college. They didn't move him to cornerback. They moved him to linebacker. They bulked him up, but not this guy. Uh, and I think on the other side of things. Angel Reese, after they lost, she really went on a – she was crying at the post-game press conference and saying you don't know what she's been through and stuff. And I think Angel Reese, a lot of the the backlash she got all came from this. When she did this in front of Caitlin Clark last year at the NCAA final game. And to me, I'm like, you're just talking shit, but she went out of her way to go towards Angel, where most of the teams and people, when they're talking shit, they're not going directly at the star player on the team. They're going at somebody else. So a lot of the a lot of the backlash that comes to LSU is because how cocky they are when they win. And I, listen, I ain't mad at them. You know who they remind me of? They remind me of the Fab Five at Michigan when that happened. Again! Fab five, first ones wear black socks. Five black guys starting, uh, freshmen out of left field. And they, they talk smack, and they backed it up. And here's, the, here's the thing about the Fab Five. Back then, as a white guy in high school and stuff, when all that happened, you know, the hip, me new to the hip-hop world, like I was, I was just starting listening to hip-hop back then and stuff, I was intrigued by the Fab, I was intrigued by the Fab Five, but I, the media – painted them out to be, I wouldn't say thugs, but, you know, talking smack very much like the media makes Angel Reese and the LSU team out. And look at the Fab Five now. All five of those guys end up being super successful in life. Take out basketball and life. And you know probably the one of the most successful people on, the, on, on that Michigan title run of 92 and 93 – is Rob Palenka, who ended up being the white guy, <clears throat> first white guy off the bench, and he ended up being Kobe's agent, and now he's in the front office with the Lakers. So people forget he was on that Fab Five Michigan team. That's what's crazy. And I remember I went on I went on Jalen Rose uh, talk show on ESPN a couple years ago when the Bengals went to the Super Bowl, and I literally I got to tell him, I go, dude, I, I just wanted to say, I said, you guys, all five of you guys on the Fab Five end up killing it in life as adults. Take away the basketball. Take away all that stuff. Just in life. So you got to ask yourself, would you rather have, you hear all these horror stories, 30 for 30 going broke. The other day, would you rather have a national title ring, but your life turned out to be shit? Or would you rather be part of the Fab Five, where they came up short in the national title game, but all five end up doing really well in life? And I don't think that's talked about enough with the Fab Five. So I just think with Angel, a lot of this, backlash you brought on yourself and it's okay you all you've you've always stated this is just me being in between the lines 
and you just got to – you have to zone the negative stuff out and focus on, the, on the, the positive. And that's human nature, and that will come with age as she gets older. But I think when you're young and now we're in a social media age, she's taking all this stuff personally. But a lot of people aren't against you or coming at you. It's just it's so easy to focus on the negative when they do come at you. Uh, it, and it's human nature. I do the same thing. I get on social media and I'll have 1,000 great comments, but that one negative is the one I want to respond to. It, it's I don't know why we're like that. I don't know why humans are like that. And then it really, if you look at the, the people that make the negative comments, they're just negative people in general. So if I get any... If I had any advice to Angel, I'd be like, just focus on the good comments and the people that are rooting for you and screw the people that aren't. But at the same time, you got to be like, why are they doing this? It's because you talk smack and you're allowed to. I'm cool with talking smack about basketball. You're not, you've, you've, you've never made it personal. It's always been just about ball is when you talk smack. <clears throat> and it worked. It worked. These NIL deals you got, um, <clears throat> you're popular, you're Making more money you probably ever thought you would as a little girl playing basketball. It's all, a lot of it is because you did that. So the good comes with the bad. Um, so, yeah, so, man, these the, 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 the female NCAA tournament, who would have thought that would have taken over? The whole deal. I, I mean, the male, I mean, we're for, it's, it's crazy that NC State has a man and female team in the Final Four. Nobody's really talking about it at all. Uh, Connecticut, same way. Connecticut's got men and women. Dang, I just really Connecticut and NC State, and the 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 the, the Connecticut men. There's there hasn't been a more dominant run than I can remember since like UNLV back in the day. Can you imagine? If, can you imagine if UNLV had NIL back then with Larry Johnson, Anderson Hunt? Oh my gosh, it would have been stupid. Uh, they'd have their own wing at the MGM, basically. So. All right, let me get to some of these questions from Twitter because some of them were, were actually pretty good. And I didn't know, I didn't even know if anybody would respond because everybody seems, Twitter's not what it used to be. Now it's everybody's on Instagram or TikTok. But let's see, there was, there was actually some good ones. Uh, there we go. Oh, <laughs> one guy said, How do you make a million dollars? I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to make it. Porn, that's one way to make it. I'm not saying you got to do that, but porn is one way you could do it. Uh, favorite restaurants on the road that I always swing through. Man, there's so many goddamn good restaurants out there. Uh, I think a lot of my go-to is like True Foods. It's always good in every city. Um, I usually be looking for steakhouses. Like, oh, there's so many good steakhouses. I don't know. That's, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. But that's when I said I knew I was getting older, too, because I used to go to season and look for bars and nightclubs, and now I'm looking for coffee shops. So now I, I know I'm officially getting older. Uh, why aren't new Get Some episodes on Apple Podcast? Why aren't we? I thought we were. We got to check into that. Uh, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm just reading these in real time because some of them just came through. Not a real question, but a few weeks ago, you said you were going to go to give us a Dallas story. Unless I missed it. I don't think you did. I like 40 sharing memories about your brother. Uh, I did share a story, but I I shared a story with Dallas, and then I forgot the next week. So then the week after that episode is when I shared a story about my brother Dallas. And I'm trying to think, is there another funny story about him? Okay. Yeah, here's a funny story when he was when he was a kid. So when we there me and my brother Dallas, there's an eight year difference. I was eight years older than him. And when he was probably five, so I was 13, we used to go to this lake called Barkay Lake in the middle of Podunk, Indiana. And a lot of my family, we, literally you pull in, and I thought I thought Barkay Lake was like Yellowstone. I thought it was the greatest place on earth. They had a lake. You can go swimming right in a lake. There was a diving board. There was a slide. You just slide right into the lake. And you... We had these little trailers, and all of them were little run down. Not like trailers you live in in a trailer park, but little run down, like camper trailers. So my grandma and grandpa had one. My Aunt Rita and Uncle Bill had one. Then my aunt, my, my Uncle Billy 
and his his wife Donna had one. So there was three of them right there, and that was our. If one of us wasn't using it and one of them, somebody wanted to come in, we could we could stay there and sleep in it and stuff. Never, there's not a shower in these things. Uh, there might be running water, but not really. You had to go to the camp shower grounds, right? Those are so nasty because I would be daddy long legs and spiders in those showers. And we didn't wear shower shoes. No, I didn't know about shower shoes till I joined the Navy. I didn't. I I didn't know anything about shower shoes till I started hanging out with black people. <laughs> I thought we just white people, baby. We we raw dog it in the shower. I, we don't use washcloths. I never used a washcloth until I got in the military. I remember when they gave me the towels. I said, like, what's this for? And they was like, that's what you wash your face. I can wash my face with my hands. That could be why I got this scar. I don't know. Maybe I had dirty. I had a dirty face in the sun. Because uh, that's funny. When first time my doctor asked me about the skin cancer stuff, he said, yo, you use sunscreen growing up? I said, I grew up in a trailer park. You know, sunscreen went outside and played. I putting on sunscreen. <laughs> we didn't know what banana boat or Tropicana was. So these 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 showers were so disgusting looking back on it, and we had no problem jumping in there. Uh oh, I just remember there were so many daddy long legs. Daddy long legs are like special needs spiders. I don't know how they're they got no face, they got no mouth. It's just these long legs, and it's just like a little ball in the middle, little brown ball. And I'm like, how do they eat? How do they survive? So anyways, maybe I got to look that up. Uh, but w- so we had this little bonfire. So our trailer said he had little campers. I don't want to say trailer, campers. And we had a little bonfire we'd set. And we'd always go fishing. And everybody caught carp and bluegill. Carp's like the nastiest fish out there. So we never ate it. We just caught it and then threw it back. So we were sitting around the bonfire one night. And the, keep in mind, the adult men are drinking and all the teenage boys, like, we might sneak a beer in because they're not looking like, oh, my God, we got a beer. And we go behind one of the campers and drink a beer. But the the drink of choice with the adults was Schaefer beer and Jack Daniels whiskey. That was it. So my Uncle Bill had a fifth of Jack Daniels. Keep in mind, where this lake was. There's nowhere to go to get food. We we would bring our food, and we basically lived off peanut butter and jelly, Doritos, Mountain Dew, and I think one of the campers had a little fridge, but pretty much everything stayed in the cooler because usually we're only there for two or three days. And so you can't just go get liquor like that. You can get beer, but you can't just go find liquor. So my I, I guess nobody realized Dallas – at five years old, was going behind people and just drinking the different drinks, right? So he probably took a swig of a beer nobody knew, Mountain Dew, Pepsi, water, things like that. He got Nobody realized he got to my Uncle Bill's fifth of Jack Daniels, and he took a swig, <laughs> and, went, ah! and he threw it on the ground, and when he threw it on the ground, it hit a rock and just went everywhere. And I just remember I looked. And my Uncle Bill, I think I saw a tear come down. Almost like Denzel Washington in glory. It was just a single tear like, he, just, he broke my fifth. <laughs> you couldn't even laugh because he didn't know. And I was like, and all of a sudden I realized, how much liquor did Dallas drink before he got to the fifth of Jack? Because I'm looking at the circle. And there's a lot of Schaefer beer sitting around. So... Broke the bottle, so Uncle Bill had to drink beer the rest of the weekend because there was no more whiskey left to drink. Uh, I don't know if he went and got some, but you had to literally go about 30 minutes to find any kind of like Kroger or grocery store to get some liquor. So that's a Dallas story when he was five. Broke my Uncle Bill's fifth of Jack after he was probably already tanked up from drinking everybody's beer before he got there. So, uh, yeah, hope that was a funny Dallas story. What kind of music did you listen to growing up? Country, hair bands, or R&B? Come on now. I, I'm i an 80s, 90s guy. So Journey. Uh, man, you can't go wrong with Journey. Faithfully, still one of the best. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, when I was in high school, everybody was listening to the hair bands. Bon Jovi, Warrant. Uh, th- those, those rock love ballads, man. I used to really think. I was a virgin, so I ain't really had no puss yet. So I remember thinking, just thinking, yeah, this is what it's all about. If I could meet somebody like, like I always thought, like uh, White Snake, I want to meet some chick, and she's gonna dance on top of a car, and she's gonna fall in love with me, and 
that's that'd be it. And I live in North Carolina near the beach. For some reason, I always thought. Uh, but but the girl would be black on top of the car. Wouldn't be a white girl. <laughs> so I would say that. A lot of my friends, like I was an FFA, Future Farmers of America. So a lot of my friends would listen to all the country songs. And I, I it's like I knew the songs, but I didn't know who sang them. And then as far as like hip-hop and rap, man, that was Run DMC days. Uh, God, Troop. Silk and Shy. Oh, my gosh. You're taking me back. Uh, so yeah, that's probably listen to what are the, when are the new specials coming out? Any new merch coming out? Yeah. In fact, new merch is dropping this week. If you go to Gary Owen dot live, which is my website, we got, we got get some podcast shirts that are dropping this week. So I'll be selling them at my shows these next two weeks in Houston. Cause I always sell t-shirts at my shows. But, uh, like I said, I got two specials in the can and we're still trying to sell them. Uh, I got one, the one that we're going to call Broken Family. And then the second one is yet to be titled. But I got two we're shopping right now. So maybe one of these days Netflix will come around. But I'm not going to be this bitter guy because I really think every comedian thinks we should have a Netflix special that doesn't. And really, when I watch uh, when I watch these podcasts, and there's so many podcasts with comedians out there. And I'll see some comedians go on. And they sound like they're bitching. When they, I've seen, I saw one comedian, she had said like, she started crying and she's like, why haven't I gotten my shot yet? I just want my one shot. And then another comedian I saw on a podcast, he was saying like, they use the same people over and over again in all these movies and TV shows and stuff. And I think for me, once I let that go, trying to get other people's approval, trying to get on other people's shows, I said, you know what? I'm just going to make my own content. And I'm going to, that's one reason I do the podcast. I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. Uh, it's the one reason I do my own specials. Of course, I'm shopping on the networks. Worst case scenario is nobody wants it. And I just take the clips, cut it up, and I post the whole thing on YouTube myself or anywhere else that I can. I, Facebook, I can TikTok, uh, Instagram. As you can see, you don't need the networks anymore to blow up. A la Matt Reif, a la Desi Banks a la uh, Drewski. You can do your own stuff. So I think the best thing about co uh, podcasts and interviews now, when I see comedians go on and they still seem like they're a little bitter, I'm like, I don't want to sound like that. And I'm, listen, I'm thoroughly enjoying this stage of my career where I don't have to sit around and be frustrated. I can pull out my phone. I, re I can record something. Like I, I just posted a clip this week of me and Raleigh where a girl – got mad because I wasn't telling old jokes. And I was like, I'm so glad a lot of these clubs now are coming equipped with camera systems because I didn't hire anybody to film me that last, the, the week I was in Raleigh, but the club goes, no, we got it. We got our own camera system here. I was like, no way. So I was like, ah. so I got it and posted it. So we're in a great state. So I would just say to these comics, man, be mindful of how you sound when you go on these podcasts and you're like, you know, how, why haven't I got a Netflix special? And I was like that for a long time, but now I'm like, I'm like Morgan Freeman in Shawshank Redemption when he kept going off for parole. And when he really wanted to get out, they kept denying him. And then when he finally went, you go ahead and write what you're going to write, because frankly, I don't give a damn. I, that's where I'm at right now. If I get a Netflix special, great. But if not, I don't really need them like that. I'm good. Either way, I can just put my own shit out there. So thank you, TikTok. Thank you, Twitter. Thank you, Facebook. Thank you, Instagram. Thank you, YouTube. You have completely given comedians especially uh, an outlet to get our material out there, to get our thoughts out there and everything else. You don't need anybody. So uh, somebody said, when are you coming to Oklahoma City? This summer, I am coming to Oklahoma City. So just go to GaryOwen.live for all my tour dates. That's all you got to do. How was the show in Wichita? It was great. Did you move about the city? I did not. I went to my hotel to the venue, and that was it. I Uber Eats. So, listen, my hotel was great, and I ate it. I got coffee from Scooter's Coffee. Uh, it was a great coffee spot. That's pretty much all I got to say about Wichita. <laughs> and the catering was good at the show. Oh, here comes some bitch. Why are the Browns so much better than the Bengals? They ain't. They ain't better than us. What you talking about right now? I see, I see what's going on here. Let me shout this guy out. At Ray Skilkilki. 
at R A Y S K I K L E. Ray Skeekly. Skeekly. Yeah, I can't even say your name. What you talking about? The Browns ain't better than the Bengals. You better shut your mouth, fool. Uh, how many times a week are you, are you referred to as Gary Owens with an S? Every day, every show, every time. I said, if you want to know what black people's favorite letter is, it's S. It is S. There's 26 letter, letters in the alphabet, and black people love the letter S because they love making things plural, especially me. I mean, ask black people. I, I guarantee you black people go to restaurants, and they'll be like, hey, you got some shrimps? Show could use some shrimps tonight. It's shrimp. Hey, let's go to Kroger's. It's Kroger. <laughs> What's up, Gary Owens? I'm a big fan. It's Owen. Stop. So, <laughs> yeah, all the time. God, this guy had like a four-part question. Is the earth flat or a globe? Come on now. It's a globe. Uh, favorite concert? Bernie Mac. Favorite stand-up concert of all time. It was the first time I've ever seen a comedian at a theater Destroy for an hour and a half straight. He had dancers. Yvette Wilson opened up. Such a good show. Is that the Universal Amphitheater? That's the first time I ever went to a big comedy show. And I was I was just starting out as a comedian and I was in awe. So that to th- that'll always be my favorite concert of all time. Musically, uh favorite concert music was I would say Charlie Wilson. If you've never seen Charlie Wilson in concert. He can go, bro. I saw Charlie Wilson in Cincinnati. They do this Macy's Music Fest one time. And this is not a knock to John Legend. I love John Legend. He's always a real cordial Ohio guy. But Charlie Wilson went up before John Legend one night. And I think they should have flipped it. And Charlie went up there. And, you know, he's high energy. He's all over the place. got his dancers. Then he, then he, he basically... Realize he's like, you know, he takes everybody to church. He closes the show. I was a crackhead. I've been delivered. Da-da-da-da-da. And every time he's saying something, the band's playing something like, da-da-da-da. you know, you know, I was, I was 5'11". Now I'm 6'1". I, you know, I, um, I was on my deathbed. Now I'm alive. I didn't know Jesus. Now I know Jesus. And every time, da-da-da-da. and it, it's just building. And then he goes, get out your Uncle Charlie. And the crowd is in hysterics. <sighs> And then they brought up John Legend. And it's not like this show had already this show is already four hours in by the time John Legend goes up. You know, John just walks out, gets on the piano, and we're just ordinary people. <laughs> and it just went whoosh. And you went down because John just doesn't perform like Charlie. He just he's into the music. Man, I felt so bad for John Legend that night. Ooh, ooh. They should have flipped it. No matter whose hometown it was, because John was Springfield, he was close to Cincinnati, they should have just flipped it that night. To have a concert that long and for Charlie to just, boom, this is probably, God, 13 years ago? God, my eyes bother me right now. Uh, I would I would have flipped that order. I would have just flipped it. But, yeah, that was, that. yeah, John caught a brick that night. He caught a brick that night. <laughs> but obviously it didn't affect his career that much. Uh, favorite dinner? Favorite childhood, best childhood memory. Uh, favorite, my favorite dinner is always probably be a, you get a good steak, bro. A good steak off the grill. Mm. And soak it in Worcestershire sauce overnight. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably my favorite dinner. Like even my favorite restaurant in the country is probably Peter Luger's in Brooklyn. Like, I don't know what they do to that steak. It's so goddamn good. And best childhood memory. God, uh, that's, that's hard to say. Uh, hmm. leaving <laughs> probably when I left and I was 17 that's probably the best job of memory because I remember it just it was freedom after that was freedom all right now before I get out of here uh a comedian cohort of mine friend Marlon Wayans he had he's got a I, I hate when I hate when my comedian comrades go through stuff personally and it plays out on social media so Marlon as a kid a one-year-old, and I've 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 known Marlon had a baby since he had it because I just know you just know things. And Marlon was going the route; he's choosing not to talk about it on social media or bring it up. But then it got out there that the baby mama, uh, she was she wanted more child support, and immediately all the headlines said Marlon Wayans had a secret baby, his secret baby. And I was going, 
It's not, listen, it's not some secret baby. It's just a kid that he didn't want to pronounce on social media. And really, it's none of our business. And everybody's like, he had some secret he was withholding, didn't want anybody to get out. No. If you look at Angel Reese, all the shit she's going through off social media, all Marlon was doing was protecting his child. So, and then the now the baby mom wants to go back for so much more child support. He was already giving her so much. Hold on. Let's see how much. Since since it's out there, I would never talk about this if it wasn't out there, but it's out there now. Uh so I just it's so funny how they the headlines will run with it like he was do almost doing something shady. Nah. He had a kid. And he didn't feel the need to announce it because social media can be mean. And so he currently pays $18,000 a month. And the baby mama wants an additional $2,000. And I'm just going, what? <laughs> Here's what I'll say. As a guy that went through an ugly divorce, and you go back and forth with ex-wife, baby mama and stuff, in the end... Most guys, and I'm not going to say all, but especially for me and me knowing Marlon like I do, if you did need an extra 2000 it's something that you could probably call and talk about instead of going to court because here's what's going to happen. Once you go to court, and as, as a guy that – any guy that's quote-unquote a breadwinner that makes a lot of money, uh, you become bitter because you feel like – you don't, you don't want to help that person in the future. If they need help, you're going to look back and be like, man, you were just trying to really just have me work, 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 or have Marlon work, 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 and then I, I, I get the benefits from it. I, I want all the money. And you don't really care how, how he gets it, really. So I just think if – I think if you're cool – I think if you ever needed extra or needed something, then you could go to the, the baby daddy or the ex-husband and be like, can I get this and probably help you out? I, I, at least I would, I would think. Uh, but, I mean, God. It, I think the headline really got me with this one was secret baby. <laughs> he wasn't a secret baby. He had a baby with a girl, and he didn't feel like announcing it to the whole world. And now... Uh, what does it say? Wayans currently pays eighteen thousand dollars a month, and the baby mom wants to do so two thousand. According to court documents, she's also requesting that Wayans be allowed visitation rights. However, the comedian objects to being a visitor to see his child. Do you pay all that money per month to and be called a visitor? Which is facts, and it's just entitlement is all it is. Like that's all it is. Oh my god, it's just ugly. Comedian and father, Marlon Wayans, going through it after the mother of his toddler, not going to give her name, filed a new paternity suit. Uh, she's currently getting $18 out of the month. And Marlon said it's a classic case of a good, loving, responsible father shelling out over $18,000 per month for a one-year-old and an entitled woman decides she wants more. Uh, Wayans cited his two previous children and said he's never encountered this issue before. Yeah, because Marlon... And his other two children, he never had no issues with that baby mama as far as it wasn't paid out publicly or she probably didn't take him to court if she needed something. And he's been a good father to his other two kids. I know that for a fact. Uh, definitely not a Debbie dad. Definitely, definitely not trying to have them live off the bare minimum. He's a very involved parent. Um, all these women having to drag men to court who pay nothing towards their children. And here a woman gets a doctor's salary and says it isn't enough. So true, man. He, Marlon said, I'm a good man with a good heart, strong sense of responsibility, but I refuse to be used and discredited. Uh, he kept his latest child out of the news cycle because he believes his business is no one else's. Exactly. Uh, the baby isn't a secret. The mama's posted stuff about the baby, but I chose to keep the baby's private life private and nobody's business. Social media is toxic and dangerous, and I'd like to keep her peace. That was just what I said before I even read that stuff. Exactly. Uh, so... Yeah, I hate to see him. I hate to see him going through that. And seriously, a one-year-old, $18,000? You're good. You're good. <laughs> you know? And I know Marlon. I know him. Like, 
if the baby mom was down and out and couldn't pay anything or anything, he would make sure she's good. He's not going to make, sh- he's going to make sure that his child is not living in poverty, is not living in a bad neighborhood, is not starving or anything like that. So I don't know. You almost got to ask when's enough's enough. Um, so trust me, I get it. All right, y'all. Again, Houston the next two weeks. If you want to see me this week all fucked up, come down this week. Because if you come see me next week, these stitches will be out next Monday. All right, y'all. This is Gary on the Get Some Podcast.